Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 60th Emerging Growth Conference and day two of our first two-day super virtual investor conference. Just a few notes for those attending. During each company's presentation, you can submit questions through the webcast module, and we will attempt to address as many of these as we can at the end of the presentation. Today, we're running until about 3.30 Eastern time. And when we switch to the next company, you're gonna see a black screen for a moment, but don't go anywhere. That's just us moving over to the next presenter. But if there is some downtime, refresh your browser. Usually everything work, works properly again. And our platform does work best on Google Chrome. So if you're watching from an Apple device, you have to hit the play button to start the session. And remember, all of our conferences, they're uploaded to the Emerging Growth Conference YouTube channel. So subscribe there at youtube.com slash Emerging Growth Conference. And one last note, after today's event, you'll be redirected to the registration page for our next conference. So stay on or come back to reserve your spot early. Let's welcome our first company. We have Ad Alta. It trades on the ASX under the symbol 1AD. It is a drug discovery, development, and commercialization company focused on generating a pipeline of next-generation eye body therapeutics to treat challenging diseases in fibrosis and oncology. Joining us today is Ad Alta CEO and Managing Director, Dr. Tim Oldham, who has more than 20 years of experience in life sciences business, portfolio, and product development across Europe, Asia, and Australia, with a particular focus on biologics, cell, and gene therapies, plus pharmaceutical products. He has been CEO and Managing Director at Adalta since 2019. It's a pleasure to welcome you, Tim. Nice to see you today. Thank you, Anna. Great to be here and great to kick off day two of Emerging Growth uh, Conference today. Absolutely. The floor is yours. Call me back when you're ready for questions. Fantastic. Thank you very much and welcome everybody. It's my privilege to join you from down under uh, to present uh, our unique take on solutions to debilitating diseases. Let me switch through the usual disclaimers. But right up front, let's go to the purpose. The purpose of our company is to go where traditional antibody therapies cannot. When antibody drugs first emerged onto the pharmaceutical landscape around 30 odd years ago, they transformed our ability to target really challenging diseases with unparalleled selectivity and specificity. Seven of the top 10 pharmaceuticals today are antibody drugs. But despite that wild success, they still can't do everything. And this is where the search has been on for smaller format antibody-like molecules and platforms uh, that can deliver that selectivity and specificity uh, without the complexities of large size um, and other disadvantages of these very, very large antibody molecules. And Adalta's iBody platform that underpins everything that we do is one of the tools to success in this smaller, what we call single domain antibody space. You can think about Adalta using our iBody platform to produce this high value next generation protein and cell therapy pipeline targeted at those areas where traditional antibodies have been unsuccessful and don't work. So we run our business in two ways. The first part of our business is a discovery business where we use our technology platform to discover lead candidates for these challenging diseases. These lead candidates or our iBody inventory, if you like, can be used uh, in our own product development business or they can be sold or partnered immediately uh, as candidates for others to, to develop and extend. When we use them ourselves, that extends into our product development business, where on our own or in collaboration with uh, partners, uh, we take those lead candidates and turn those into real products, progressing them through preclinical development, uh, demonstration of efficacy in animals, uh, development of manufacturing processes, and then into the clinic. We can do that ourselves, or we can co-develop those with other companies. Um, and in general, we'll carry those through to uh, early clinical development before we'll out-license to other pharmaceutical companies. We have a pro portfolio today comprising products in the areas of fibrosis and inflammation, uh, and also in the areas of immuno-oncology. We generate value for our shareholders by creating products that large pharmaceutical companies uh, wish to acquire or license from us to complete development and then ultimately commercialise. So let's move on to the products we have in our pipeline today, the products that bring our unique technology to life. 
We have products in the areas of fibrosis, our lead asset, uh, AD214, um, could meet the desperate need for new approaches to this debilitating uh, scarring of internal organs. As we go through this slide, I'd like you to remember one number. That number is 13 million Australian dollars or around about nine to 10 million US dollars. That's our market capitalization today. In the areas of fibrosis, products at the same stage of development as AD214 have been licensed in the last four years uh, about eight of them for $45 million upfront payments and up to $320 million to a $1 billion of subsequent milestones. Remember to compare that with $13 million Australian dollars or $10 million US. Similarly, our second portfolio is three products in development in collaboration with Carina Biotechnology in the emerging field of CAR T cell therapies. Uh, these are transforming outcomes for blood cancer patients already. Uh, our opportunity with Carina is to offer that same hope for patients with solid tumours. The benefit of this space is that commercialisation is much faster. Uh, in this instance, comparative licensing transactions generating upfronts of 10 million uh, and milestones of in excess of 3 million, 300 million at preclinical development. So only after we've cured mice. Uh, much faster and much lower investment to get to that point than it is to develop a therapeutic. The final product we have in active development today is a result of our collaboration with GE Healthcare, the world's largest uh, pet imaging company. And here we're developing a pet imaging agent uh, to help patients being treated with the new checkpoint inhibitor drugs for cancer uh, <clears throat> to identify responders early. The beauty of these products is that they've changed hope for cancer patients from years of survival to the probability of long-term survival for 20 to 40% of patients. But we don't know if you're one of the likely successes uh, until about six months, and if your tumor's progressed, it's too late. This imaging technology could identify those responders and non-responders in days and weeks after treatment starts. So we have this robust portfolio of five active development programs. Um, one already partnered, uh, three in co-development, uh, one fully developed ourselves in AD214, all of which have the potential to generate uh, upfront payments on licensing at multiples of our current market capitalization. And all of this is underpinned by our iBody technology uh, that can deliver more and more products over time uh, and be an ongoing source of revenue. We have an extensive team of people. In fact, we're quite unique or relatively unique in the Australian biotechnology landscape in that we em employ our own scientists. Only about 10% of Australian biotech com companies do that. Um, and this creates uh, enormous uh, flexibility, scale and learning advantages in our projects and really gives us a point of difference relative to other Australian biotechnology companies. You can also see that there's vast industry experience on our board and in our advisory board. Um, and this gives us a, a significant capability that we're looking to leverage, not just with our own technology, uh, but potentially with complementary technology down the track. And we'll talk more about that later on. So let me now turn briefly to AD214, our lead program. Fibrotic diseases are scarring of internal organs. In this instance, I'm going to use idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis as an example. It's our lead indication. Scarring creates stiffness and lack of flexibility or elasticity in tissues. We're familiar with that when we cut our skin. When that happens in your lungs that are expanding and contracting every second for your life, uh, that's a bit of a problem. It significantly reduces your respiratory capacity. And unfortunately, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is a progressive, irreversible, unpredictable, and today uncurable disease. There are almost half a million people living with IPF around the world. Uh, the average survival is around four years from diagnosis. We spend over $4 billion a year on two therapeutics to treat IPF, and they do not work particularly well. They slow, but definitely do not halt progression. And they have serious side effects that prevent patients tolerating these drugs often for longer than a year. But fibrosis affects almost every organ in the body as well. So kidney fibrosis, eye fibrosis, many cancers have a fibrotic component, um, are all significant and important diseases that our drug could extend to. So what have we done to date? We've built a really strong value proposition around AD214 today. It's a first-in-class molecule. Uh, this means that 
uh, it is differentiated from all other therapeutic approaches, which is really important for pharma companies' reimbursement. We've demonstrated preclinical efficacy in multiple animal models of different fibrotic diseases, particularly lung, kidney, and eye. We've completed successfully a phase one program demonstrating the drug was well tolerated. Uh, we have a strong intellectual property and regulatory position with patent protection out to 2036. And the new news uh, that we've just released last week um, is that we've now demonstrated that the clinical, clinically viable dosing regime that we wish to use in phase two could be efficacious. This is a bridge we've not been able to demonstrate until just last week. The next steps involve a phase one extension study to increase the uh, top dose we've studied and can commence in our phase two program uh, based on that new clinical um, viability, viable, clinically viable dosing regime. We're accelerating partnering discussions. We expect to partner this asset before going into phase two. Uh, and we're planning and preparing for that phase two program so that our partners can take a flying start uh, once we've established that relationship. So let's turn to the new data. What we've just announced, just released last week, is data showing that the dosing reg regimen that we wish to use in phase two, that is clinically viable, i.e. it's a minimum of every two weeks between doses, could be efficacious. We knew up until now that the drug was effective in animal models. We knew that we had a distribution of uh, the drug onto its target receptor in humans. Uh, that extended out to two to three weeks, but we didn't know whether that receptor occupancy or blocking of the target receptor was sufficient for efficacy. We've now shown in a model system of fibrosis uh, in some lab studies that indeed there are levels of target occupancy that we can achieve uh, at two weeks after a single IV injection are sufficient to have an efficacious effect on that process. This is huge news. We knew it was effective, but we have to be effective at clinically convenient dosing regimes We've now established that. I mentioned the value that pharma was attributing to these assets. This is a table showing comparative deals uh, for IPF assets at preclinical through to phase two in recent years. And you can see the numbers I talked about earlier. Those upfront payments are all significant multiples of our current market capitalization. I'll turn now briefly to our CAR T program. Um, this is one of my personal uh, favourites, and it's actually, I think, the potential to be the killer application, if you like, uh, for our iBody technology. Uh, CAR T cell therapies involve re-engineering a patient's own immune cells so that they see cancer as though it was a pathogen or a foreign body instead of your own cells gone wrong. It involves taking your own cells to do that and produce a living drug that is, of which a single dose can be potentially curative. Uh, and the images on the top right of this slide are a nod to Emily Whitehead, one of the first uh, patients ever to receive CAR T cell therapy in a clinical trial. Uh, it failed multiple lines of chemotherapy, uh, basically had no other options, just celebrated 11 years cancer free um, and her 19th birthday. These products have already generated over $2 billion in sales a year since they were first launched in 2017. There are now five products approved by the FDA um, all in blood cancers. The hope now is we can translate that opportunity into solid tumours. That requires more complicated multifunctional CAR T cells. And this is where the eye body's selectivity and specificity becomes a significant advantage. We've tried to illustrate that on this slide. Essentially, the tiny eye bodies take up less room in the gene that we need to introduce to an immune cell than traditional technologies. And that means we can create multiple functions. Uh, the picture on the right shows uh, an immune cell in grey. The CAR receptor is this complicated structure here with the little red eye bodies on the end. And when the eye body engages the tumour antigen, it sends a signal to the immune cell that secretes molecules that kill the cancer. The benefit of the eye body is we can now have binders to two different receptors or two different antigens on the tumour. That means we've got greater chance of uh, killing all the cells in a tumour, many of which may not express each of the target antigens. We can also secrete the little eye bodies to block some of the immune checkpoints that the tumor uses to hide from the immune system. So all of that becomes possible with our small format antibody-like technology. We have a first collaboration with Carina Biotech in Australia where we're exploring up to five targets uh, on this technology. And we're getting significant industry interest from potential additional partners 
for using these eye bodies to help them target their CAR T cells or to defend their CAR cells from the tumor immune suppression. And again, these technologies are valuable. They're being acquired by larger pharmaceutical companies at very early stages. Uh, the table here shows the value of deals um, <clears throat> that were executed at preclinical proof of concept, as I mentioned earlier. This is after we've cured multiple mouse model, mouse um, or multiple mice in in, in vitro, uh, in vivo studies, and established manufacturing. Right. Now, we can get there with much lower investment and much shorter time than we can to develop a therapeutic into phase one and two clinical trials. Um, so this, I think, is a really exciting application of our technology and a key focus for our outlicensing of the iBody platform going forward. So let's return to why we think Adalta is a, an opportunity that you should be thinking about for your portfolio. Firstly, the iBody platform itself is a really powerful drug discovery tool capable of engaging targets that are difficult or intractable for traditional antibodies. And the cartoon here shows the fundamental difference between our eye bodies, the small uh, red molecule on the right, from the much larger traditional antibodies that simply cannot get into these really tight binding pockets, such as they're found in um, uh, receptors that trans, trans, uh, transcend the cell membrane. Importantly, the small size also means that we can create modular and, and almost like Lego blocks um, to create uh, multiple different drug formats. So we can use them and extend their half-life by adding long tails to them. We can make bispecific molecules out of them that target two different antigens. We can, we can produce radiotherapeutics or antibody drug conjugates. Our collaboration with GE Healthcare is an example of doing that, for example. And we can make these wonderful CAR T cell therapies. <clears throat> We're actively monetizing the platform today. Uh, we have three major partnering initiatives to generate return on investment um, in the midterm and potentially even the near term. The first of these is out licensing AD214. We've invested a lot of time and money in this product. The next stage is significantly expensive. For us, it's time for this asset to earn a return on investment for our shareholders. <clears throat> and the chart on the right shows the, the depth and breadth of the partnering activity that we have underway for this molecule. Uh, this shows at the end of the bio uh, industry partnering convention in Boston in June, the status of our pipeline. It only includes companies that are in active discussion with us for AD214 that have confirmed strategic fit with their pipeline and a desire for further information at a minimum. Um, and at a best case, they're under CDA and we're in deep technical discussions. We're also seeking to further outlicense our iBody discovery platform. Uh, aiming to conduct uh, or develop more collaborations such as we have with Carina Biotech and with GE Healthcare that offset the costs of drug development to ourselves um, and or bring complementary technology such as the car cell platform. And finally, because we have one product in the clinic and the remainder of our pipeline is largely at discovery stage at the moment, we recognise that there is importance to fill that clinical stage or near to clinical stage pipeline to create meaningful inflection points. And so we're actively seeking to access, in license or acquire complementary near to clinic assets that will benefit in the long run from our iBody platform. Um, and we have a, a robust group of advisors helping us with all these uh, partnering initiatives um, <clears throat> across the world, uh, based in Australia, Singapore and the US. So that partnering strategy is no surprise that our upcoming milestones are largely uh, and inflection points are, uh, are largely influenced by potential partnering opportunities. The strategies you can see on the left-hand side of this slide, we want to realise the value of AD214. We want to extend our ICAR programs. We want to execute on our PET collaboration with GE Healthcare. We want to continue to invest in the iBody platform and synergistic technologies that go with that. The grey shows the robust operational milestones we have. Um, starting last week with the announcement of this new data confirming our clinically viable um, administration process for AD214, but following through with the phase one extension study later this year and additional data from our CAR-T programs. The red shows the blue sky upside, which we know is not built into our, our share price today, uh, which is all around the potential of transactions to transform the momentum and scale of our company, both from a cash, but also from um, a capability perspective. So as an investment proposition, you know, we have a powerful iBody platform to create novel drug therapeutics where other technologies have failed. 
Uh, we have active portfolio in fibrosis and inflammation and in immuno-oncology. Our lead program is heading towards phase two and partnering, addressing a $4 billion plus market. Uh, we have two co-development collaborations in the immuno-oncology space already. Uh, and that comprises four programs addressing between $20 billion and, and down to $6 billion with the PET imaging program. We've demonstrated product development and partnering expertise. We've done all aspects of drug development through to the clinic. We've established major uh, collaborations. Uh, we have the team in place to do more. At a $13 million market capitalization, or about 9 million US, um, where we have significant blue sky opportunities, not just from executing on our existing pipeline, but from the inorganic growth opportunities that are presenting to us and that we're organized to execute. We've got a steady operational news flow coming, um, which underpins the uh, existing momentum. We have a really attractive current valuation and significant upside. And my contact details are here. Uh, and with that, Anna, we'll see if we have any questions, please. Great job, Tim. We do have some questions for you. Uh, let's see. Let's start with talking about how broadly can the iBody platform be applied and what are some other uses, use cases outside of the current programs? So we've deliberately focused the applications of the iBody in places that traditional monoclonal antibodies can't go. Uh, if you can hit a drug target with a monoclonal antibody, you should do it. It's established technology. It's ready to go. Um, so we're focused on applications where you need the small size selectivity and specificity. Um, a good example is the family of receptors called G-protein coupled receptors. Um, these function like the inbox for your cell. They process the signals that are going on outside the cell, apply a set of rules and tell the cell how to respond. 30% of all drugs today are approved against these GPCRs. Um, <clears throat> only two monoclonal antibodies have been approved, showing how difficult they are to target with this technology. Uh, so we have a particular focus for therapeutics on this family called GPCRs. Um, <clears throat> then we have the ability to combine the eye body with other technologies. Um, and so, as I mentioned, we've got a program in CAR T cell therapy today already. Uh, the other areas I'm really excited about are other immune cells like natural killer cells, where you can apply the same idea. And we're increasingly exploring the opportunity to be the payload for mRNA delivery using the technology that was introduced for our COVID vaccines, but is now being used to deliver antibody-like therapeutics in situ in the body rather than having to inject the drug outside. And that really needs a small size as well. So it's a combination of that ability to hit unique and difficult targets like GPCRs with that <clears throat> small size that give us our advantages. We've hit over 25 different targets. Um, we have, in addition to our five programs, we've got two others that are dormant at the moment, just waiting for pharma partnerships. Um, and we have some really interesting ideas in the pipeline for down the track. Thank you for that. Uh, talk a little bit about the 8214 phase one extension study. What do you expect to get out of it? And do you expect to get any efficacy signals out of the phase one study? Now, unfortunately, phase one is uh, about safety. Um, we actually have got some patients approved in a second cohort in that extension study. Um, so we can extend into patients, but it will be a very limited number of doses. So the primary purpose is safety. What we're aiming to do is increase the maximum dose that we have uh, demonstrated the safety and tolerability of 8214 uh, at. And the reason for that is we now know and have a better idea of the type of dose we think we need for therapeutic efficacy in phase two. So by doing this study, we do a couple of things. We extend the safety profile up to that dose. <clears throat> we explore some of the trends we saw in safety and, and build the robustness of the safety package to help address some of the questions that pharma partners have been asking us. And we shorten the phase two study because we won't have to then do the run in at that, that dose escalation phase at the beginning of phase two. So it's a shorter, cheaper phase two study. Um, uh, it's adding value to our partners now. It's the single best investment we can make ahead of investing the big money to run a phase two program to help advance this particular molecule. And Tim, how much cash do you have and how far will it take you? Um, so we finished, uh, we just announced our, our quarterly results this morning. Um, we finished the quarter uh, at 30 June uh, with about 4.7 million Australian dollars in the bank. Uh, we've just also announced the completion of uh, the last part of a capital raise. Uh, that's added another 1.8 million. So we're looking at just over six and a half million uh, in the bank account right now. 
Um, <clears throat> the large part of that raise was designed to fund that phase one clinical program where you, we currently burn around two million a quarter. So we've got funding through some of the next milestones. Good, well, speaking of, talk a little bit about what those next milestones are. Uh, so the next big one operationally uh, will be first patient in or first participant into our phase one extension study. That should happen in August, uh, very early August. We'll expect the initial results from the first three doses that as those patients will receive in late October, early November. <clears throat> we'll expect the top line results uh, from that page, uh, from the healthy volunteer cohort um, in early January. Uh, the patient Fair. cohort will then run in the first half of next year. Um, <clears throat> in addition to that, we've got data readouts we're expecting on our CAR-T program with Carina. Uh, we're expecting the initial in vivo uh, proof of concept work for our first product uh, later this year. Um, and that sort of rounds out really our, our, um, our operational milestones. Yeah, the upsides are really around transactions. And I'm not, not going to forecast when those transactions are happen, going to happen because that straight away puts me at a competitive disadvantage in doing the deals. Uh, but we're hopeful that that's, uh, that's not a long-term scenario. That's uh, you know, inside the next 12 months, we should see something. And last question for you, Tim. Talk a little bit more about the partnering strategy. Who do you think your partners may be for 8214? Uh, so... We sh I showed a slide earlier with around 20 different active partnering conversations. Um, they were grouped geographically by the headquarters of the companies. You can see that those companies are headquartered in all regions of the world, North America, Europe, and Asia. Um, the, the, there's a combination of companies in that list. Larger companies, uh, you know, multinational top 20 big pharmaceutical companies, Almost all of them have a fibrosis pipeline or an inflammation pipeline that this asset fits into, and there are a number of those in that mix. Uh, we're also working with a number of what I call national champions in China and Japan. Um, and the objective there is that those local champions probably understand those markets better than anyone, but they also form somewhat of a stalking horse for uh, the big pharma companies that we're negotiating with, because as we start to get those deals done in those markets early, those national champions know they need to beat Big Pharma in, otherwise Big Pharma will take Japan and China as well. Then we kind of create the auction process that we want to do to maximise our deal terms. And we've just appointed uh, two new advisors to help us with that process as well. Perfect. Tim, we do have a few more questions from our audience. Would you like to take some? Happy to do that. Okay, great. Uh, Saul Bradford asks, uh, he just read your PR on your trial results. So what does this do to your timeline to sales? Um, so, it, this the results we released last week probably don't reduce, uh, don't um, shorten our timeline to sales, but they substantially de-risk it. As you would know, biotechnology, um, uh, you know, has a high failure rate as you go through clinical trials. Um, we knew our drug was effective. What we didn't know was whether it would be effective at a dosing regime that was convenient for use in the clinic. And our results last week showed that that was actually possible. Um, and so that's a massive de-risking for the overall program. It's something that pharma keep asking us. Do you know that that receptor occupancy is enough to deliver efficacy? And for them, that was a big risk because they were going to go and spend the $35 million or whatever it's going to take to do phase two. Now we can say, yeah, we've got increased confidence in that. You know, influence is a key mechanism of, of fibrosis. Um, so it's not going to shorten time to revenue, royalty revenue, but it's going to de-risk the asset, um, increase the probability of a deal with pharma, and that brings forward partnering revenue for us. And Nikhil Murillo wants you to talk about licensing. Have you had any licensing deals yet, and how lucrative are they or could they be? <clears throat> so the first two deals we have done have been co-development deals on our iBody platform. Uh, the first one was with GE Healthcare. Uh, we entered that collaboration in uh, 2019. Uh, that's a co-development deal. In fact, it was a co-funding deal where GE have essentially paid our discovery costs. Uh, so they basically looked at our platform and said, this delivers things that we need to deliver these particular pet imaging agents. Um, and, and that was really our first commercial validation platform. Carina is much more of a cost sharing arrangement, um, combining their technology with ours. Um, again, both of those in some respects were really about building the proof principles, the proof points for our um, our, our platform and its capabilities. Um, 8214 is the first major asset that we'll be seeking to license as a company. Um, having said that, you know, I've been in business development for 20 years um, in various different roles and companies. 
Um, we're working with um, uh, two groups that specialize in business development and, and um, uh, strategic collaborations and investments to help us progress a number of really interesting opportunities. So uh, we're bringing every piece of expertise we can to the table here. And a question from Eric Moses, you spoke about this already, but uh, maybe uh, reiterate 8214, how far out is phase two? And can you talk about any potential partners, any big names in there? Yeah. Um, so the answer to the second question is easy. No, I can't. Um, uh, it's it's would breach our confidentiality agreements um, and doesn't help either of us in in progressing those. Um, yeah, you can look at some of the names that are on that um, uh, deal comparator sheet that I showed earlier. Uh, those guys are all still actively looking for additional products in their pipelines as well. We know that. Um, so that gives you an idea of the types of companies we're talking to. Um, in terms of timelines to phase two, uh, we need to manufacture drug product for the phase two trial and we need to complete the six month um, uh, toxicology, extended dose toxicology studies. We have those slots booked waiting for partnerships to help us fund those, um, but they're obviously going to take a little bit of time. It's a minimum of six to eight months to do the drug manufacturing, for example, six to eight months for the trial. Um, so from here, we're looking at early 2025 for phase two. And Hassan Wilkerson wants you to talk about your team's history in bringing drugs to the market. Um, great question. So uh, let's start with the board. Um, our chair, um, uh, Paul McClemon, uh, has, has worked with a number of uh, ASX listed uh, biotechnology companies that have taken products through to um, <clears throat> through to licensing and, and, and outsourcing. Um, one of our other directors, David Fuller, was the former um, head of clinical operations for Cineos, one of the world's largest contract research organisations. Um, he's done more clinical trials to develop oncology drugs and other drugs than anyone I know. Um, and Robert Peach, based in San Diego, was the science, chief scientific officer and founder of Receptos, um, a GPCR therapeutics company that has taken uh, programs uh, all the way through to the clinic uh, and beyond. Um, so at a board level, we're, all, we're well served in that perspective. Um, our team is is relatively um, uh, young at the moment. Um, we do have, as I mentioned, sort of expert advisors, people like Darren Bampton as our clinical and regulatory operations person. Uh, he has developed drugs through to phase uh, three, uh, is his most advanced, I think. Um, uh, I've not taken proprietary drugs through to phase three, but I have taken biosimilars um, through to late stage development as well. So. Uh, we have a diverse range of experience that we can call on at board and advisory level as well. And our scientific advisory board have taken drugs through uh, all stages of development at Pfizer, Novartis and GSK. Wonderful. Well, Tim, do you have any closing remarks for our viewers? Look, thank you for the opportunity to introduce the company to, to you. Um, I really do think we are on the cusp of really transforming this company from single product to multi-product, uh, from micro cap to, to, to mid cap. Um, we've got all the pieces in place to have a, an amazing year um, and we look forward to um, more of you joining us on that really exciting journey ahead. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Great presentation. Great product. We'd love to have you back with some updates in the future. Thank you. I look forward to that. Okay, perfect. Okay, everyone stay with us. We'll be right back with our next presenter.